We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovics. Joining me today is Keith Weiner, president of the Gold Standard Institute of the USA, CEO of Monetary Metals, and also holds a PhD in economics. Thanks for joining me today, Keith. Hey, Tom. Good to be here. Excellent to have you back as always. So, Keith, you recently released a field guide on how not to think about gold. So let's dig into some of those most common misconceptions about gold and how people think about it. You know, we we kind of started this morning before we hit record by you telling me that a lot of this stuff you actually wrote many years ago, right? Yeah, this is, um, you know, we just compiled different bits from different articles that I put out over the years. So, you know, if you put this all together, this would make a useful, uh, you know, field guide. And so we put it together. Um, and then, you know, I added fresh graphics and a few fresh statistics and whatever, but. Mm-hmm. And it's it's just funny how, a lot of these pieces seem to be so evergreen. So why don't we kind of start at the beginning here? Is the price of gold tied to the growth of money supply? And is that the only chart that you, you know, the the one chart you need to know about gold? I, I love, I, I mean, I think in general, whenever you see a political meme, you see anything else and it's like, you know, bam, mic drop, you know, mind blown. And, you know, the one thing you need to know, yeah, the one thing I need to know about your media channel is that you're, um, you know, belittling my intelligence by telling me there's only one thing I need to know. Um, there's a lot of things you need to know. And so, uh, but, you know, specifically, if, and, and we've done this um, in our annual report um, at least once or twice, is plot the price of gold against any measure of the money supply. What's called supply, it's actually a stocks, not a flows, right? So wheat supply is a flows. That means how many tons of wheat per year are being created and consumed. Money is a stock, so it's how much exists. Um, it's not a, it's not a flows. But you know, compare it to M0, M1, whatever you want. And the gold price just doesn't really have a great correlation to that. Just one of those things that everybody believes it just makes seems to make common sense, just isn't so. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess kind of an abstraction from that, the actual supply of money is the inflation statistic. You know, we all see the CPI numbers. That seems to have maybe maybe a, a weak effect on gold in, in the day-to-day movements when we see a hot or a cold CPI print, you know, that comes in below or above expectation. But does gold track the CPI or inflation itself? Not, not really. Um, you know, and, and there's a couple of reasons. So I would say gold tracks the loss of value of the dollar. And most people would say the word purchasing in front of value, or you know, purchasing power. Um, and, and that's a nice, convenient shorthand for a layperson to kind of think of like, okay, how fast? I mean, we all know the dollar is going down in value. It is designed. That is not a bug, but a feature. It's purposefully designed to go down in value. Mm-hmm. All the leading, uh, I call them, uh, you know, Keynesian Friedmanite uh, thinkers, they would of course, take exceptions to that and say, we're, you know, the mo- we monetarists are totally different. Um, but I lump them all together. Uh, you know, Milton Friedman had his K percent rule. He thought that the ideal magic right number for uh, the dollar to lose its purchasing power was 3%. Um, you know, today, arguably, the Keynesian monetarists feel that it should be 2% because of the change of language to indicate maybe they're, they're flexible, they're open to the idea it should go down faster than 2%. But they're looking at consumer prices. And if you're looking at consumer prices, there's a whole heck of a lot of forces that push consumer prices up and down that aren't monetary. Mm-hmm. I mean, lockdown being a biggie, tariffs being a biggie. And tariffs have a very um, uh, uneven effect. So let's say the U.S. government um, you know, slaps a big tariff on imported lumber from Canada. Well, then the price of lumber in Canada collapses and the price of lumber simultaneously in, in America rises. Mm-hmm. I mean, is that just the Canadian loony gaining in purchasing power and the U.S. dollar losing in purchasing power? It's not a monetary phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Um, I've written a lot about the U.K. passed two stupid laws back around, I think, 2017 uh, or 2018, one of which banned domestic hydrofracking, 
uh, which meant ban domestic production of natural gas because that's how natural gas is produced. Um, and the other forced uh, power companies and all the heavy industry to switch from coal and oil to natural gas, which no longer can be produced domestically. And um, it reminds me of uh, that video that they used to show in driver's ed, at least when I was in school, um, X number of years ago, called The Final Factor. And it shows like some, you know, 20 car pile up on the highway. And there's a woman who's using the rearview mirror to put on her makeup. And um, there's somebody who's tailgating and there's somebody whose tires are bald and there's a truck that leaks a little bit of oil and, you know, all these different things, any one of which wouldn't have caused the pile up, but all of them in combination, you know, led to the synergistic result, which is this massive pile up. Um, the, those two stupid laws in the UK had this incredible synergistic effect with lockdown and what that does to the shipping industry in particular, where you have, you're dependent entirely on imported natural gas, and suddenly you can't import Christmas tree ornaments, let alone natural gas, because of the global snafu of, of shipping. And so then the price of energy skyrockets more than what, 10 or 15 times. And the price of everything depends on energy, which is everything, uh, and most especially food, fertilizers produced using natural gas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, everything skyrockets. And, um, you know, people say, well, the pound sterling has lost purchasing power. That's not exactly accurate. So gold does not change in price just because of this kind of stupidity. Um, the, the change in the price of gold is really the, the inverse. It's the mirror of the change in price of the dollar or of the currency. And, and most people say, when well, you measure gold in dollars, and I would look at it the other way around and say, you're trying to use the, um, the deck of a ship that's slowly sinking and in tossing around in stormy seas, and you're putting a transit on that deck and measuring the lighthouse and saying the lighthouse is going uh, up and down and mostly up. And I would say, sir, your, your vantage point is not objective. Mm -hmm. It's not the lighthouse going anywhere. And so um, what gold is measuring is the decline in value of the currency, but not necessarily purchasing power. Although, of course, as the currency is losing value, it is, you know, prices are getting more expensive, but the price picture, the consumer price picture is a lot more complicated than that. And a lot of extraneous non-monetary factors mm -hmm. in uh, consumer prices. You know, going back to your point about tariffs, it's it's so interesting. I was having a conversation yesterday about, you know, let's say the, the incentives for tariffs themselves. I know in, in Canada, there is a 400% tax or tariff on any imported dairy. This, you know, seems to protect the Canadian dairy industry while simultaneously keeping anything else from the country out. And it just seems, you know, like such a backwards way to try and do things, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, obviously getting outside the monetary swim lane Every time somebody proposes one of these stupid things on Twitter, uh, if I see it and I have time, I always comment and I say, desperately taking the desperate measures that are desperately taken by desperately poor countries, you know, bit by bit, you're going to build a, a starving banana republic where they always, you know, try to tariff the imports to protect the locals and then ban or, or tax heavily the exporting of anything because, hey, we can't export our food. Our people need our food. You can't let those rich Yankees outbid the locals for food mm -hmm. and the more they do with that perversely the poorer they get and no one asks the question why are we getting poorer like no one sees the trajectory they're just one flail you know one flailing you know thing at a, at a moment like a drowning person just flopping around in the water mm -hmm. not asking hey wait a minute i got to be a little more strategic about how i spend my energy here yeah no it's, it's absolutely horrible and um canadians are i mean of course that hurts u.s dairy farmers the ones that are close to the border, and it would be easy to truck milk across the border, but uh, or cheese, I suppose. But um, it hurts the Canadians even more. Mm -hmm. You pay more for dairy than uh, than you would. And um, I mean, I mean, irony of the whole thing does that really help the Canadian dairy industry? And it's like any welfare program. You know, you see some inner city, you know, kid with obviously no father because uh, the incentives of the of the welfare program. You know, if, if the parents are married, they're not eligible. So there's a bachelor herd. They're not, um, you know, nobody's getting married. And you see these kids that are morbidly obese at age 10, you know, 8 or 10 or 12 years old. And um, supposedly welfare is protecting them or saving them. Really? 
and you see the way they live, you see what's on their mind or what isn't on their mind, which is reason and, and logical thought and science, you know, are we really helping them? You know, at best, it's it's a, a well-fed rat in a cage. Yeah, again, going back to the idea of incentives, it, it incentives and or let's say outcomes, it really you know, doesn't make sense if we try to sit back and objectively think about what the actual outcomes end up being of a lot of these, a lot of these interventions, right? And I think it makes the argument even stronger to have the free market make those decisions based on outcomes rather than those interventions that, as you say, are are typically reactionary, right? Yeah, I was going to say, but there's, from, from the socialist perspective, there's one fatal flaw for free markets, and that is it doesn't give anybody a free lunch. Well, sure, you might argue it's more efficient, whatever efficient means. But look at all those people over here that deserve a free handout, and the free market isn't going to give it to them. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's right. That's not a bug, sir. That's a feature. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody has got to step up and find a way to add value for their fellow human being, and everybody is enriched by uh, by so doing. And of course, the reverse, you know, everything collapses into Venezuela if you try, if you try the other. On the other approach, sounds a lot like you're talking about personal responsibility there, Keith, and that that seems to be lacking in this day and age. Yeah, I guess that that's not politically correct it's to say that people should take responsibility for their own. You know, what did Thomas Sowell say? He said we've gotten to the point where nobody's responsible, nobody can be held responsible for their own decisions, but people are supposed to be responsible for the decisions of people, you know, six generations ago. Mm-hmm. It's some pithy way of saying that. And you know, you just shake your head, and that's like so true. Mm-hmm. We've arrived at that destination. So, Keith, let's let's get back to, you know, maybe maybe a correlation to interest rates here. Is there a correlation to, you know, maybe the inflection points in an interest rate cycle with the price of gold? Let's say when the Fed starts cutting rates or when they pause. This seems to be a big anticipatory moment for, you know, what might drive the price of gold. Yeah, I mean, I think these these are complicated phenomena, and when when there's a turn, you can you can focus on the data series itself, and then you know if, if you're living through it, then of course you're highly aware of the context. So right now, um, everybody's trying to anticipate the Fed's turn. Mm-hmm. It's pretty clear that they can't continue to hike rates or even hold them high. Um, I'm one of the few that. Said the same thing before this hike cycle in, in February a year ago, as I said before the 2015 cycle, which is I don't know how serious they are about um trying to do this. I can't read a politician's mind better than anybody else, but I can say from a monetary economics perspective that if they try to hike, they won't get very far mm-hmm. or hold it for very long. Well, this one they've pushed, certainly pushed it farther, but at at the uh um at the cost of enormous amounts of destruction that are now baked into the cake. When they finally are forced to turn, you know, is it the turning of the interest rate number as such, or is it the, um, you know, the, the blowing up of all the balance sheets that the Fed is responding to at the end of the day? Um, and when those balance sheets are blowing up and the Fed is saying, okay, well, now we have to ease the availability of credit um, they are cheapening the dollar in a way, um, and not primarily from a quantity standpoint. Most people just focus on the qu- quantity of it, but I, I like to focus on the quality of it, and because I think ultimately that's, you know, if gold is the barometer, what is it? You know, it's measuring something. What is it measuring? It's measuring the decline in quality, and um, I think we've now seen, even in the time. I mean, I have not been an economist um, or, or gold guy my whole career. This was a mid-career move. I was 41 when, um, just about to turn 41 when I sold my software company. I started to get into this in 2008. Mm-hmm. Um, but just in the time that I've been a direct observer, um, you know, and of course now being somewhat of a historian looking back, every time something happens, they cheat. They come up with new nomenclature. They come up with new, whether it's accounting rules for the masses, accounting rules for the Fed. Um, changing in treatment, changing in policy, doing things that previously were either illegal or unprecedented or nobody even thought of something because it was just that mad, and then they're doing it. 
And at each turn, they just, they have a new trick. They have a new way of, it's just literally cheating. Mm-hmm. Imagine you're playing, you know, you're sitting there with family and friends and you're playing some board game like Monopoly or Risk or Stratego or whatever. And, um, you know, you start to get into an uncomfortable position where it feels like you're losing. And then you just cheat. You just pull an extra piece out of your pocket and put it on the board. And it's like, well, there, how are you going to respond to that? And the other person's like, well, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I've never... I've never had a strategy for when someone puts creates a piece out of thin air and puts it on the board. Um, and it's that it's that trickery, it's that dishonesty, it's the counterfeiting that is um ultimately destroying, you know, the currency. Mises talks about this. He said, you know, when there's this unwarranted expansion of credit, there's two ways it, it will it will end. And there's only two ways, which is voluntarily. Uh, by, you know, everybody returning to their senses and saying, let's back down from this. And then you take the bust, obviously. Or if everyone continues to go all in, then the only way that it ends in the, is in the crack of boom, when the currency loses all of its, you know, value in the end. And people think of it as a quantity thing. They're just printing to infinity. But I see it as a draining of the, the quality or the um, the underlying asset that backs it. So look, so the Fed went un, underwent a very dangerous transition recently. And that is up until this episode, the Fed has had a positive cash flow. That is, it earns on its portfolio of bonds more than what it pays on its um uh on its borrowing, which is which is the reserve balance. Mm-hmm. Um and um you know, recently that flipped and now it has negative net interest margin. Which means that it's paying out more than, uh, you know, it's paying out close to 5% and it's earning two and a half or 3%. And so, okay, well, it's not remitting anything to the treasury. People say, ooh, ah, uh, you know, the treasury is going to go bankrupt. No, it isn't. The treasury is the least marginal borrower. Look to all the other borrowers first to default before the treasury would be last. Um, but something changed in terms of quality of the Fed. Previously, people call it printing, but it's borrowing. Previously, the Fed, would always be issuing new credit. And, you know, that's what people call printing. But, you know, there's a creditor. The Fed is issuing credits, borrowing off of somebody to finance the purchase of an asset that was money good. And perhaps more importantly, that asset was was had a greater cash flow than the Fed's expense, interest expense in that finance. Well, that flipped. Now the Fed has negative cash flow that is going to be obliged to create more credit not to buy more assets that have more cash flow, but simply to stanch um, a negative cash flow. And you can see how that's a vicious spiral. So let's say you're losing, it's a lot more than a dollar a year, but just to make a simple example, a dollar a year, you have to issue credit, you know, one extra dollar that you're not using to buy good assets, but now that you're using to just make up your $1 shortfall, but that dollar now has interest on it of, let's call it, uh, well, five cents because it's 5%. So next year you have a dollar five shortfall that you have to borrow a dollar five to make up, and you can see how that's going to increase and increase and increase, and that if that runs away, that becomes a death spiral uh, of the entire currency. And why? Because the quality of what's backing it, there's nothing backing that. It's not a treasury bond. It's not a mortgage bond. It's not a college you know, student loan bond, or you know, and it's nowadays the Fed is empowered to buy corporate bonds and who knows what else all of which have cash flows or presumed to have cash flows and collateral. Now you're creating this to simply finance a loss and it goes out the door. Well, that's that's a death spiral. That's the beginning of the end. And um, of course, gold is, that's precisely what gold is measuring. And so that the value, so the, the value of the dollar today is roughly 15, 15 and a half milligrams of gold. And the more they do that, the more that you'd expect that to drop to, I don't know, let's say seven, Seven and a half uh, milligrams of gold, which would correspond to a gold price of four thousand dollars an ounce. And not that I'm predicting that, you know, in the near future, but you see the you see the driver of the trend. Well, you know, Keith, as we recently saw these bank failures, that really put this question of confidence into many people's mind. Do you think that that starts to, you know, bring this more to the mainstream view and help? undermine confidence in the dollar as you know you you rightly pointed out that there is nothing backing it yeah i was gonna say i mean historically there was the debt backing it 
And then as the debt is of declining quality, that's that's the issue. But um, I mean, so you, you bring up a very good point. Silicon Valley Bank shows that it, you know if you are a retail saver or, or uh, investor, to own the dollar isn't merely exposed to the risk of the Fed and the Treasury, which which exposure you do have, but in, in piled on top of that, you have the exposure to your banking institution. And what if your banking institution is unsound? So uh, most people don't know this. Um, when um, the last crisis, the last major crisis occurred in 2008, a lot of people um, thought that, you know, if not the cause, at least something that exacerbated it, was um, mark the market accounting rules. That if you're a bank and you have a bond um, on your balance sheet and the value of that bond is going down in the market, that you, uh, up until that moment, you had to mark down the value, which of course impaired your own capital, which meant your own bonds were going down, which meant your creditors were then marking things down and it became this vicious spiral. Um, now, any Austrian school economist would say, yeah, that's right, that just reveals all of the unsoundness uh, that was that was enabled and created during the preceding boom, but that's not how the mainstream, you know, the Keynesian monetarists uh, think of it. So um, a lot of folks, including some in the sound money community, uh, Steve Forbes, uh, who I consider a friend, um, but you know, he went on record of saying we've got to end mark to market and an editorial. And so we did. And um, I think it was March. I don't remember the exact date. I want to say it was March of 2009. Uh, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, uh, they're the, they're the uh, I guess, accounting I'm not sure they're exactly a regulator, but they're the ones who set the standards for, for this. They said, okay, well, now if you're a bank, you don't have to mark to market if you declare something to be hold till maturity. Um, okay, great. Sounds good, right? It all sounds very abstract. But that happened to be almost to the day that the market found its bottom and then began this epic bull market. Well, that's right, because everybody was able to restate their books in a way that looked a lot more... Um, you know, it improved the optics. It was great window dressing. So um, everything was fixed, right? And, and you know, we went on to another um, almost decade and a half of boom, uh, you know, following that uh, as a result of that change. But what does that do? That means that any financial institution that is taking losses on its bonds is now not writing those losses in its books. Of course, paper does not refuse the printed word. You write, you know, a piece of, on a piece of paper, and you write down, "I'm solvent. I have a billion dollars in capital on my balance sheet." Well, great, you know, the paper doesn't refuse that, and so there it looks. And anybody who believes that, well, woe unto them, because you don't have that capital. You have a bunch of bonds that you promise. Oh yeah, I really, really, really intend to, um, uh, you know, hold these until maturity, but you don't know whether you're in a position to honor that promise or not. You made a promise that. Succeeding management teams may or may not be able to make good on. Uh, and if circumstances change, you will be selling those bonds that you promised to hold. And circumstances did change. Now, Silicon Valley was the marginal bank. They had the greatest inflow of the retail deposits, or they're not really retail, but they had the greatest inflow of deposits during the incredible VC boom of 2020 to 2021. And then, therefore, as, as those companies were spending that money, that money, those deposits were leaving Silicon Valley Bank. And uh, they find that their um, their deposit base was being stripped, not initially by panic, but just by the the action of VC backed companies that are cash flow negative. Um, and um, as the deposit base is going out, that's the financing that funds the balance sheet. They have to sell the assets to raise the cash to to meet all those uh, withdrawals. And um, then suddenly they're selling bonds that they had promised to hold till maturity, and they're realizing it was like a surprise, surprise. You're realizing losses that you never said you had in the first place. Well, as people started to see that, then they said, well, you have to withdraw. This bank is not stable. This bank is not safe, thus accelerating the losses. And, you know, the sharks were, uh, you know, smelled blood in the water. They smelled one of their own and, um, you know, went in for the kill and they got torn to shreds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, by the ensuing uh, uh, panic. But, but to your question, um, does this reduce confidence? You know, not necessarily the dollar per se, but again, if you're a retail saver or investor or depositor, dollar means a bank deposit. 
and you're not eligible to open an account directly at the Fed, uh, not yet until they until they introduce Fed now or whatever. Um, not Fed now, what do they call it? Fed now is just a faster SWIFT system. Mm-hmm. They have something that I forget what they're calling it that, that might be a direct deposit that they offer to not a CBDC, but something sort of sort of in between. But you, you're not eligible to open an account there. Um, most retail people are not sophisticated enough and don't want to jump through the hoops to own treasury bonds, to own a dollar means to own a bank's to, you know, deposit. And then if the banking system is unstable, yeah, there's a whole new set of risks that were there all along, just people didn't really think about them, and now they're thinking about them. And I think that's one reason why the price of gold is as robust as it is, as people are logically turning to gold. Gold is the money that isn't someone else's risk, mm-hmm. that's some counterparty's risk. Keith, you know, as we're speaking about the, let's say, the confidence in the dollar, one of the other, let's say, misconceptions that get thrown around quite a bit is the, you know, this imminent death of the dollar. Imminent, when, yes. Sorry? Imminent, yes. Yes. Good so morning. When did you, <laughs> when did you, you know, first write that? And let's talk a little bit about the path forward that you see ahead. If it is, you know, a, a dramatic turn or if it's, you know, something else entirely. Yeah. So in our um, wrong ways to think about gold, you know, which is, which is really a compendium of, of stuff that mostly mostly a compendium of stuff that I've written a long time ago. Um, one of which was, uh, you know, the imminent dollar collapse, um, and the context in which I was writing. And I, I wrote this somewhere between 2013 and 2018. Let's say I don't know when. Long time ago. And there's always been these persistent, especially in the gold community. Um, there's always these persistent rumors, and and each geopolitical thing. You know, it's like a whole new story, and there's a whole new set of believers that are trafficking in that story. Um, and so at that time, it wasn't, didn't have quite the same flavor or feel as, as it does now. But what I was trying to say at the time is, if you're looking for a trading signal, right, if you want to buy gold low and sell it high uh, and use gold to trade to make dollars, okay, far be it for me to tell you not to do that. I would say I blame the, I blame not the player, don't blame the player, blame the, the Fed who's forced everybody to play. By depriving us of a yield, then we're all forced to find a speculation of something that the price is going up. And so people try to use gold. Um, and I, I will say, everyone knows, I think, that I'm not a pro-Bitcoin guy. But I've said many times, Bitcoin is obviously superior to gold at skyrocketing and also crashing. So if you're looking for something that makes a great bet to make more dollars, uh, and assuming that your timing is right and you're smarter than the rest of the Bitcoin herd, uh, Bitcoin would be your place to go and not, and not gold. But a lot of people, certainly before Bitcoin's you know, incra- incra- incredible meteoric rise in, in uh, what was it, 2021, um, uh, you know, tried to use gold for that purpose. And, I, and, I'm, and I, was, I was basically saying, look, if you're trying to use gold as a trading vehicle, you need indicators, you need signal to tell you when to buy and when to sell. Um, any kind of story about the dollar's imminent collapse is not that indicator. It just doesn't have any predictive power. First of all, the dollar is not imminently collapsing anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, that's the sort of grand global macro backdrop that is not a timing or, or trading signal of any kind. It's just something that's going on there. Now, in, in the present milieu, obviously, yes, there's everyone saying buy gold. It's going to go to $50,000. The dollar's collapsing. Um, but, and there's a certain irony, right, to say gold's going up as measured in a currency that I just told you is collapsing to zero. Mm-hmm. Well, why would you continue to use this thing as a measure if once you realize it's going to zero? I mean, get out of that paradigm. Stop using a collapsing thing as a measure. It's not a measure. It's at best a rubber band. But, um, you know, is the dollar going to zero? Uh, no, it isn't. Because, number one, all the other currencies are of lower quality. But for the most part, those governments are much less transparent. Which, by the way, is a big, big reason why, and there's many reasons why nobody is going to use the yuan as a reserve currency. But one of which is the incredible opacity. And by opacity, I mean they don't release data so much as propaganda that you know just try to make them look good at all times. It's like 1984, emitting a steady, steady stream of numbers. Nobody could use those numbers. For, nobody could rely on it for anything. Um, you know, they're just making victims of their own citizen slaves. But um, 
you know, so, so no, nobody could turn to that you know, for that reason. And, and people focus on the ills of the dollar because the evidence of the ills of the other currencies is a lot less available on the internet. And so everyone focuses on the thing that we have this incredible wealth of data about. Ironically, that's part of what contributes to the strength of the dollar. And um, number two, the other currencies are dollar derivatives. Uh, you know, that's what reserve means, is that every every major balance sheet in the world, and not just the central banks, have dollars on both sides, on the asset and the liability side. And um, you can't just replace, I mean, in theory, you could dump all your assets. Uh, at, at, you know, if you're willing to take losses, you can just sell every asset you have and denominate it in dollars and buy assets in another currency. But you can't replace your liabilities. If you owe a billion dollars, how do you replace that? You can't. Mm -hmm. You're stuck with it. And it's the it's the liability side. It's the struggles of the debtors that give incredible uh, value to the dollar. So, Keith, you know, gold is often touted as a real form of money. And many tell us that it will help protect us from, you know, as we've been talking about, this dollar's imminent collapse. But in your view, is the dollar basically a balloon in search of a pin or, you know, Getting back to this question, is this a grinding process that will take years to really play out as changes are made and reduce this overall demand for dollars? Well, I don't see, I mean, so there's two things. One, yes, it was definitely much more of a grind wheel than a pin in a balloon. Um, these things don't happen overnight. I mean, yes, at the end, suddenly, but um, you know, what, what did Ernest Hemingway had a character said? Had a question was, how did you go bankrupt? And he said, um, at first, slowly. Then all at once, mm -hmm. um, we're not in the all at once phase anyway. But you know the thing about the rest of the world, and I, and I travel a lot and enough to see, you know, not necessarily talking with um, prime ministers and central bank governors, but I'm talking to, you know, sometimes people that are one or two levels down from that. I can certainly see in the rest of the world, there's a, a, a strong sentiment the dollar is not doing them any favors. I mean, even in countries that are friendly to the U.S., we won't even talk about a lot of places that aren't friendly. Uh, but even in the friendly places, they see the dollars doing them, you know, no service. But that's that's sort of their political messaging. But when they make their decisions, their decisions are, are usually made based on the incentives that are available, and the incentives are uh, to load up on dollars, um, in part because they have so much dollar debt to service. The more debt you have, the more buffer of cash you have to have. Imagine two small business owners, let's say it's a print shop, and, and they're both generating, I don't know, $100,000 a year in, in uh, net revenues. One of them has a couple of million dollars in debt. He's loaded up to the gills with debt. And the other guy has no debt whatsoever. Well, how much cash buffer does the first guy have to carry versus the second guy? The second guy, as long as he has payroll for, I don't know, call it two or three months, maybe, he's fine. The first guy has to carry that plus, you know, a whole lot more because if he can't roll his liabilities, if, you know, things get, you know, revenue is hit because there's a lockdown, whatever, he has all this debt he has to service. And if you fail to service it, the creditors take away, you know, your business. And so their, their demand for cash is going to be quite, quite different. But the other thing I would say, as far as um, repudiating the dollar, sending all the dollars back. To America is kind of the broader theme here. People think of the dollar like it's an object, you know, like it's 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 this this is a, you know a bar of gold, but um, you know if it was a physical object, then all the objects could be put on pallets and stacked and you know shipped back to the U.S. The dollar is not that. It's convenient to think of it that way. I think most people don't give it any further thought. The dollar is not that. It's not an object. It's not an entity. It's a relationship, and the relationship is one of being owed. As soon as you look at that way, you realize that, so I, I want to use the analogy of electrons flowing current in, um, you know, let's say in a semiconductor. You can look at the flow of electrons, or you can look at the flow of holes. That is, you know, silicon doped with whatever that has a, a slot for an electron, and the electron's missing. And sometimes it's more useful to look at the flow of the holes, but... You know, it, it, it's a it's a relationship. It's something that's missing there that actually, and and you can't move. That's not transportable in the same way. It doesn't have free form, six degrees of freedom of motion, the way the electron would. Um, those relationships aren't going to all 
be exported from Europe and Asia to the U.S. That's just preposterous. Um, all those debtors and all those creditors have those relationships for reasons that go way beyond the superficial thinking of, of Fintwit. And um, uh, it's not so easy to break. Um, so not only does this, this, this a grindstone that takes a long time, but the dynamics are quite different. And the people that are locked in that um, you know, in that dynamic, that are players on that board, are there for reasons, and the incentives are still as powerful as ever to continue to, to do that behavior. So, you know, when will it change? Well, in the end, the whole thing fails. But there isn't going to be another paper currency that replaces the dollar. There's only one thing that's capable of doing that, and that's that shiny, yellow, heavy, you know, I guess if you're a Bitcoiner, you call it a rock, which isn't quite true. It's a metal, not rock. But um, that's the one thing that's going to replace this. The only thing that can replace it. And um, ain't nobody wants that right now anyway, so that's not happening. Is, is it because of the quality of that um, asset versus the doll? Yeah, and, and or it's a number of qualities. Right? So people say, well, gold is rare. Yes. I mean, it certainly isn't sand or water. It isn't that rare. It's not unobtainium. Um, unobtainium would never work as money. And it has that interesting quality that it's relatively rare and it's relatively expensive to produce, but it's not just the cost of production. It's discovering the next gold deposit. And so it's not a matter of price. Like you can, you know, just throw more money and increase it. Like copper, as the copper price goes up, there's a lot of marginal copper production that can be turned on. But is it really true in gold? And so what you have in gold is enormous stocks to flows. There's a huge amount of the stuff out there, much more than official estimates, which puts it at 200,000 uh, tons, $13.5 trillion, roughly. There's a lot more than that, and we don't know how much. You cannot inventory it. People have been hiding it from their governments and their nosy neighbors for 5,000 years. It's not inventoryable. But in addition to that, gold has, um, and you mentioned before we started recording, a gold versus Bitcoin debate. And there's a lot of those going on. And I was in one sponsored by the Soho Forum held at the Mises Institute in Auburn. Um, I guess that was last summer, so coming up on a year. And um, one of the points I made is, uh, I, I only put one slide up, it was a graph showing the price of gold over the last 5,000 years, and it was a flat line labeled one ounce, as in the price of one ounce is one ounce. And I said, look, this is not just some stupid tautology, you know, uh, A equals A or whatever. This What this is saying is that the value of the next, the nth plus one ounce of gold, is the same as the value of the ants. And that in any other commodity, if you accumulated significant buffers of it, um, you would you would see a, a crash in the price. That would be called a glut. In the case of gold, there's no such thing as a glut. Uh, we accumulate it without any apparent limit, which means the utility of gold at the margin does not diminish as you increase the quantity at the margin, which is not true for any other commodity. I mean, that was the marginal revolution of Menger was to realize that value diminishes at the margin, but not the value of money does not. And that is probably the most important quality of gold, because it means that gold is an economic constant. It is a, an objective measuring stick um, for economic value, which means if you borrow a bunch of money and operate an enterprise business over 30 years, you know whether you've created or lost value. If you're using a measuring stick that's all screwy and it's collapsible and telescoping, like a rubber band or a gummy bear. And 30 years later, you know, a business that you bought for $100,000 is now worth $10 million. You don't really know whether the business has gone up or down in terms of economic value. You know, it's gone up in terms of dollars, but you know, the dollar's gone down. And so you're somehow trying to adjust that. Gold is the thing that um, doesn't, doesn't have that problem. And so gold has a number of qualities that make it better as money. Than, than anything else, um, and all the other all the other all the other elements are in place. People are happy to hold it, even though it's been officially demonetized for going on a century. Um, it's still behaving as money. We're still accumulating more of it, um, and uh, you know, and its value is certainly robust. Um, and like anything else, if it was banned a hundred years ago, it would have gone out of style by now. Keith, you know, it's interesting to me to think about this intersection of well, many of these things that we're talking about, whether it's gold, the currencies, the yuan, 
the fledging US dollar. The intersection of all these things to me really seems to meet the road in this idea that we're going to have another gold backed currency or or maybe commodity backed currency. Do you think that's that's useful at this time, you know, considering how globally connected the world is? So I think there needs to be a gold redeemable currency. Um, and uh, there, there was one, let's say, in the 1890s. And the world at that time had an unprecedented amount of global connection, um, all run from London. And they had a very, so they didn't have, forget computers, they didn't have telephones. They did have telegraphs, but I, I think only, you know, limited places certainly weren't telegraphing around the world at that time, they had a very efficient clearing system. And, um, you know, something like 260 tons of gold in London was enough to run the world's trade and the world's monetary system. Uh, it was very efficient, you know, what they did. Um, but the thing that makes the monetary system really work is that people can trust it. That if I'm, you, you know, uh, you know, when you look at historically, let's say how spices got from uh, you know, the Far East and, and South Asia all the way over to Northern Europe. It wasn't like one person, it wasn't like one British guy who just sailed the ship all the way around the world, picked up the spices in the harbor and, and brought it back. In a lot of cases, it would go from hand to hand to hand to hand of a lot of different merchants along the way as everybody was, you know, transported it a little bit. Um, if, if nobody really trusted that there was a monetary system that worked, then trade can only exist at very small scale. Um, it's very inefficient. Things are heinously expensive. Spices are only for the you know uber rich, and that was starting to break down certainly by the 1890s because people trusted in the monetary system. And what that really means is trusting the rule of law. If I deposit my gold coin at this bank, and this is why England uh, overtook France and and the continent, as this was much more true in England in the 19th century than it was. On the continent, I, I could trust that if I deposit my gold coin in the bank, that the bank would be uh, uh, you know forced to honor my redemption according to the terms, which usually was a demand deposit, um, was forced to honor the terms of that and give me my gold coin back, or so help it bankruptcy. That is, it would be forced down to the mat and liquidated for the ben benefit of the depositors first, then other creditors, and then finally the equity holders in the end. And since it's the equity holders, that control the bank, then they're gonna they're gonna make bloody well sure that they're running a sound, you know, outfit. Mm -hmm. What when government takes it over, there's no longer, you know, that that trust in the rule of law. Now it's government officials that are doing this to us for our alleged own good, and they're gonna keep changing the rule. So if 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 today gold backed means that Putin says, trust me, a ruble is five thousand to the ounce. Um, well, tomorrow he could just turn around and say, well, 6,000 to the ounce. Sorry. And, um, so that's, you know, the idea of trust me, I'm going to hold a peg is, is, um, breathtaking to anybody who believes that for two reasons. One, the guy is just going to change his mind whenever it's expedient. Uh, you know, number one. And number two, he doesn't actually have the power to hold that peg anyway. Every time a government tries to fix a price, it always fails. There are no exceptions to this. Mm -hmm. And so for today, he's saying it's 5,000. That's until the market moves against him. And then it'll be 6,000, and then it'll be 15,000, and it'll be 200,000. You know, it, it's... So the idea of a promise like that is utterly meaningless anyways. And I think coming out of this you know, incredible bubble that we're in, the ultimate root bubble is a bubble in trust in central planners. When that bursts, there isn't going to be that kind of trust that would make such a scheme work anyway. You know, Keith, I'd like to cover a couple more points here. One we kind of touched on here, and that's thinking about the supply of gold that is mined every year. You know, that's about 1.7%, give or take a little bit, of what is supposedly above ground. That, mm -hmm. that gold supply is increased by 1.7% per year. So is that you know, production per year, does that help keep, let's say, keep the gold price down? I, I don't, I don't really think so because, 
I think, well, first of all, as I said, I think the actual amount of gold out there is a much bigger multiple than that. So it's not 1.7%, but mm -hmm. let's just say less than 1%. Um, you know, so so it's a pretty small flows. All of that gold that's that's in human hands that's been mined over 5,000 years, that's all potential supply under the right conditions. Mm -hmm. um, and so the trickle that's coming in at one corner of the market, which is fresh supply from the mines, um, you know, the much bigger issue in terms of the value uh, or the price of gold, I should say, I think the value is a constant. Um, but if you just look at, you know, conventional supply and band dynamics, you accept that the dollar's measuring it. There are things that make people choose to dump their dollars for gold, and there are things that make people choose to dump their gold for dollars. And those factors are far, far greater, I mean, orders of magnitude greater than, um, you know, whatever force that would be applied to the price based on that trickle coming out of, out of the gold mines. So the point where maybe I'll make an analogy of, suppose your car is, you're, you're, you're driving a race car at 200 miles an hour, and all the forces that are acting on that car, there is a certain amount of friction in the axle. But of all the forces that are pushing that car around, and there's some of them are enormous forces at 200 miles an hour, as you can imagine, the friction of the axle is the least of it. And so to have all this analysis about marginal changes in the axle friction, you know, imagine you had a temperature sensor in the axle, and the axle heated from you know 170 degrees Fahrenheit to 190 degrees Fahrenheit, and all this analysis, oh, that's going to increase the friction because as the metal gets hotter, it's getting bigger, and that's going to clamp a little tighter, and the shear of the oil is changing, you know, whatever. Um, that probably wouldn't help you predict who's going to win the race. And I, I that's how I view the the gold mining stuff and the you know India imports and electronics and jewelry consumption and and all those things is um you know that's not that's not the root of it. You're not looking at the big stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as, as you mentioned that flipping the let's say the supply side equation on its head, if we look at it from a demand standpoint, does the US mint, for example, you know, selling out of silver eagles, does that help drive the price of silver? So the um you know the mints rely on a supply chain that includes polished, carefully me you know, measured in terms of weight blanks. Um, right. So you know, every manufacturing process has variance in it, and um, if you know, so a plus or minus, let's say one percent or something like that. If you sell somebody a coin that's short, it's supposed to have one ounce, but it's point whatever nine something. That's called fraud. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. So all that variance has to be over. If you're giving away free metal. Um, and since the market doesn't know you're giving away free metal, it doesn't value it. There's a great deal of incentive to make sure the blanks are not overweight. And so, you know, they put them on grinders and polishers and whatever to just get them to exactly, just bring them exactly down to 1.00. Um, you know, that's relatively capital intensive equipment to make the blanks. Stamping is pretty easy. You just need to press and a die, mm -hmm. right? A die is a couple of thousand dollars once you have the engraving design. Uh, you know, the prep presses are cheap and a dime a dozen, but it's a blank manufacturing that's the um, you know, capital intensive part. And so if, if retail demand suddenly uh, has a spike in it, well, sure, everybody runs out of uh, uh, you know, eagles or maples or whatever um, because they, they can't get more supply of the blanks. Uh, you know, this, that, that supply chain is inula highly inelastic. Um, what does that have to do with the price of metal in, in, the, in the global bullion market? Not necessarily a lot. Now, if retail is just buying and buying and buying and buying and buying, and it's just not stopping. And of course, there are, for every retail person who wants to buy coins, there's somebody else who's happy to buy hundred ounce bars or kilo bars or whatever. And if that if that demand is significant and relentless, then yeah, absolutely, the price is going to go up. Um, and I think you know the past uh, what you know year or so has really been. That, that combination of, yeah, it's, it's been coins have been in and out of stock. And the premiums have been up and down, but also the, um, uh, you know, there's just been a relentless buying, uh, not just the coins, but everything else. And sure, that's, that's driven the price up. Keith, you know, one thing that you and I have talked about several times on this show is the idea of manipulation within the 
gold and silver market and prices. You know, it's often said that, let's say, governments or banks are holding the price of gold down in order to maintain confidence in the dollar. How would banks go about manipulating the price down? And how could one see if they were doing it this way? So I have to say a couple of things. First, the, the central banks, let alone the commercial banks, aren't thinking about gold. I recently had um, we recently had uh, Daniel DiMartino Booth, who had worked at the Dallas Fed for a number of years, and wrote a book called Fed Up. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was on our uh, podcast, and we were talking about this. She said all the years she was there, there was never a request for even a report or any kind of analysis of gold. It never came up in a meeting. There's no, you know, no discussion of it. So they aren't thinking about it the way that the gold community thinks that they're thinking about it. The gold price is very important to us, not so much to them. Mm -hmm. Um, Number two is, I just don't think that's true. I mean, the price of gold went from 200-ish to 2,000-ish. And I don't think anybody's changed their behavior with regard to the dollar. And anyway, that would matter to the Fed. People still use the dollar for all their transactions, from payroll to rent to buying groceries to borrowing, uh, as they always did. And number three, you know, the, the the most this is one of those amorphous hydras that if you chop off one head, and I recommend everybody um, check out my articles called "Thoughtful Disagreement with Ted Butler," and um, I, I publish some astonishing data that we've been uh, you know developing, uh, you know, to look at this. Um, it's a hydra, and you, you chop off one head, and the, the story morphs to the next one. And it's kind of a moving the goalposts kind of a fallacy or a Mont Bailey fallacy. Oh, well, sure, you say that, but have you considered this? But the persistent rumors for decades was that the um, either the central banks or the bullion banks would sell fut- you know, mass, mass quantities of futures uh, and sell them short. And futures, of course, in the, in the view of the gold community, are shunt taking away demand from physical metal. Um, and uh, um, anyways, that's what, I, that's what I proved with data in that article is, is not the case. Keith, there's another, let's say, piece to the puzzle that's often thrown about, about COMEX warehouse inventories. You know, again, you and I spoke a little bit about, before we hit record here today, about the idea that metal moving from somewhere that it is it is not able to be inventoried versus where it can be inventoried like SLV or something like that do those flows within the market make a material difference to the price as well yeah i i, I argue they don't um you know number one it's just metal moving from one corner of the market to the other there's an awful lot of metal out there it moves from place to place is that really predictive of anything i, I don't think so and then secondly, I mean, you put your you put your finger right on it that a lot of places in the market there's no data. I mean, how, how much you know how much silver do you know in this case do people own at home in the form of bars or other? And it's not just bars, right? I mean, it's silverware, it's tea services, it's sandwich platters, it's candelabras, all sorts of things. How much of that is out there? No way to know. Mm-hmm. And then if somebody melts some of that down and puts it into, uh, you know, turns it, they turn it into a thousand ounce bars and it goes into the SLV trust. Well, now suddenly you have data on it. And, um, but then, you know, next year, uh, SLV could shrink and those bars could be bought by somebody who fabricates them into more silverware and they go right back out into the market. And, um, so now you see it, now you don't. How much does that really change anything fundamentally? You know, I, I I don't I don't believe that it does at all. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of times that we look at the past as a proxy and a, and a guide towards the future. Is it helpful to try and extrapolate how past cycles played out to try and target the gold price in the future, or is there, you know, just so many, as you said, moving goalposts and or new contributing factors that help really play into? what is driving the price right now versus let's say 10, 15 years ago? I think that's a really interesting question. And I don't think we really touched on that in the um how not to think about gold. But it's a really interesting question. And um 
I am. I'm, I'm a big fan of that uh, that saying that history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it often rhymes. Mm-hmm. That um, you know, the trick is to figure out what are the analogies from a historical moment to now. And so people try to point to the 1970s or inflation. I think there's a lot less discussion of inflation now because all the indicators are turning down. But a year ago, everybody was saying this is a repeat of the 1970s. And I'm like, oh, no, it isn't. And here's why. Um, but I do th- I do see a, a parallel when, um, when the Fed pivots, which I think it will be forced to do. Now, I'm sure they'll use new names, reasonably sure. Uh, that they're not going to call it quantitative easing again because I think that has a bad reputation. So it'll, it'll coin some new nomenclature, but um, well, that'll help. That'll yeah. help the markets. That's right, totally. Because uh, it's not um, it's not quantitative easing. You see, it's fine. Uh, it's something else. But um, when the Fed switches to you know back back to you know falling interest rates and all out, um, you know, turning on the spigots once again. I think I think it is likely we're going to see a repeat of 2009 to 2011 uh, in 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 the price. Maybe not quite so extreme in silver. I think there was some duration mismatch in the bank silver books at that time. The government got caught them, you know, sort of wrong footed. But um, I think you're likely to see a repeat in the gold price action, uh, as everyone's going to say, "Well, that's it." They're, you know, they're printing more money, and, and you're going to see a repeat of all that all over again, and possibly bigger. Because I think I think the dynamic is right, but behind that, it's not just pointing to that moment in time and pointing to now and saying, "You see, there's one parallel." You know, all you need to know. We were talking about that earlier as well. One thing that you need to know, and everything else is is needless. Mm-hmm. No, I think the analysis is it goes pretty deep and it's pretty complicated. But I, I do see that as being a, a parallel, and that's what I would expect to happen. So, Keith, to kind of summarize you know, all of these points about how not to think about gold, how should we, you know, think about gold instead? And, and what do you find useful here? I mean, it's the thing that doesn't encounter party risk. And so, you know, I I like to use the example of Cyprus. Most people remember that Cyprus banking system collapsed. And, um, you know, the day before the collapse, you could have bought gold. In fact, I interviewed a gold dealer in Nicosia, Cyprus, about that. Oh yeah, I was telling everybody that they wouldn't listen to a very dramatic guy. Um, and the purpose of that buying that gold wasn't that the price would go up. If you had bought gold like a few weeks before the collapse, you couldn't know it of the day, but you could know things bad things were coming mm-hmm. a few weeks before. I think the price in euros was actually falling a bit at that moment in time. Um, but the, the purpose of that buying the gold wasn't the price action. It was that now you had something that wasn't subject to anyone else's default risk. Then the banking system collapses. Unemployment rate, everybody loses their job and can't buy food. And, you know, I guess the landlords weren't evicting anybody because they were in the same boat as everybody else. But um, it, would, it would be a miserable place to be on that island. If you're the guy that had gold in your pocket instead of euros in a Cyprus bank, you just walk to the harbor and offer to pay for your passage in gold. And you would have had no problem getting a boat to the mainland where the economy was booming. And um, you would have gotten a job as a citizen of Europe anywhere else. Um, and life would go on. And so I think people should think of gold as it's, you know, it's money in the sense that it's not anybody else's obligation to do anything to maintain its value in the way even a Bitcoin has that, that issue, let alone the Fed, let alone a bank deposit, let alone uh, a corporate bond or whatever. And its value is an economic constant. It isn't going anywhere. It's the value of the dollar going up and down and mostly down not gold going up and down and, and mostly up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, big macro backdrop things may be true. I mean, the dollar is losing its value. That's certainly true. But it isn't necessarily a trading signal for gold. And I don't, I'm not sure gold makes a really great trading thing. I guess if you're using leverage, anything can be a great trade. Um, but I, I would encourage people not to think of gold as a trade, but it's that portion of your portfolio where you don't choose to be a creditor, you don't choose to be a speculator, you don't choose to be investing in anything. You just want to hold some money and have the safety of knowing you have it. That's what gold is. But it always was. And, um, you know, of course, Monetary Metals, my company, got put in the obligatory plug. Uh, we're paying interest on that gold um, and still retaining the, the, uh, the gold owner's title to that. We're doing something pretty innovative, I think. But, you know, whether people choose that or not, 
if you own gold, you have a, you have an object. Warren Buffett derides it right? as a lump of metal, as he calls it. The Bitcoiners deride it as a as a yellow rock. But yeah, you have it in your hand, or in your pocket, or in the safe under your uh, desk in your office, and it isn't going anywhere. That's not a bug. That's a feature. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think of people people around. The, I was going to say people should think of it that way. Billions of people around the world. That's exactly how they think about it. Mm-hmm. And um, anybody listening to this, that's, that's how they should think about it. It's it's the thing that isn't going anywhere, and that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. And I think you know that reframe is important as well to think about about measuring your wealth in ounces versus that elastic band that could be the dollar, right? That's a hell of an exercise, and that brings a hell of a discipline to it. Every month or every quarter, people you know add up their net worth on some sort of spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. I imagine in most cases. Take the then current price of gold and divide the dollar value by the price of gold to get your value in grams or ounces. And then if that value is going down, despite all your hard work and headaches and risk and stresses and everything else, you're going down in gold terms, you're actually losing or destroying wealth. Um, you know, it could, it could cause you to have a rethink of, of your whole strategy. Now, if you're gaming, that's great. Then you're doing something right. Excellent, Keith. Of course, that field guide is available at monetary-metals.com. Is that correct? That's right. Perfect. And that's where all of your guys' podcasts, a lot of your research articles are, you know, the gold basis, the silver basis. We've we've talked about that many times in the past, and all of your other work is there, right? All, the, all of it's there. I do have a personal blog at keithweenereconomics.com, where I write things like I had a I had a I had a dialogue with Chat GPT and I asked it some please you know summarize Keith Wiener's theory and it gave me some very nonsensical almost uh, hallucination type answers it was kind of amusing mm-hmm. I wrote about you know and and being a computer geek still at heart I was able to talk about what is Chat GPT really doing is it intelligence we didn't publish that in monetary metals because it really is pretty far out of our swim lane but yeah uh, I, do, I do talk about stuff like that occasionally on my on my own blog Interesting. And of course, on Twitter at real Keith Wiener, right? That's it. Perfect. Keith, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate this, you know, in-depth discussion to hopefully help people understand some of the different ways to think about the metal instead. Great conversation. Thanks, Tom. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.